Welcome to the Country Church Morning Service with Pastor Butch Eichels. I want you to find a seat because in just a minute I'm going to ask you to stand. <laughs> this morning we're going to look at John the ninth chapter. John has 41 verses. But I'm only going to read the first 16, so don't pass out, okay? <laughs> John chapter 9. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God may be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. The neighbors therefore and they which before had seen him that he was blind said is not he is is not this he that sat and begged? Some said this is he. Others said he's like him but he said I am he. Therefore said they unto him how were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of, pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And then again the Pharisees also asked him how he would received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, for your power for your presence, for what you want to do, what you will do, if we'll let go and let you have your way. Father, for eyes that are blinded today by the things of the world, Father, we pray that they might be opened by the power of the Lord Jesus, for it's in his name we pray, and his people said, Amen. Amen. I don't know about you all, but I just love the way this group leads us in praise and worship. I come real close to getting envious or covetous until I realize that when we get to glory, I'm the only one of this group that's going to be truly retired because there's no more need for preaching. They have to lead us in praise forever. <laughs> Here I am, laying behind the cloud, saying, Sing, brother, sing. <laughs> I love it. Thank you all so much. This morning, when blinded eyes can see, and what an exciting passage, chapter, in the Word of God. It's really a good news kind of thing. The only difficult part is it's not easily divided into two or three messages. So you get the whole load. I think of a preacher that uh, showed up to preach at a revival meeting. And only one rancher showed up. And he said, well, I guess, preacher, we ought to go on home. There's just one of us. He said, let me ask something. When you're feeding your cows and only one comes up, do you feed her or not? He said, well, yeah, I feed her. And he said, all right, then sit down. <laughs> and he began to preach, and he preached, and he preached, and he preached. And when he got through, 
The old rancher came up to him. He said, you know, t remember telling me about if I call my cows and only one come up, how I was to feed her? He said, yeah. He said, I don't dump off the whole load. <laughs> well, this morning we're going to dump the whole load. <laughs> the scene is the Savior seeing needs and meeting needs. And notice these that are assembled. The Savior. And then there's the blind man. And that's the object of his love and care and concern. And then we have his embarrassed parents that we haven't read about yet. And then there is the always present critics of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's several thoughts. One deals with the helping and the hurting and the helpless, and that's in verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. <clears throat> now, I don't know about you, but it's always amazed me and impressed me as the number of people that Jesus ministered to while he was passing by. When he was going someplace else. I must needs go through Samaria. Remember that? And there was a Samaritan woman there that he needed to minister to. And there are so many people that Jesus ministered to on the way to someplace else. And what a reminder it is to us. I don't know if, if you're like me, but there's a lot of times I'm moving from point A to point B just as quick as I can. And I'm trying to get from here to there and look out for anything in between. But you know, Jesus in his earthly ministry, it took three years. And in those three years, he always had time for people. Everyone that he came in contact with, he had time for. Well, we say, <clears throat> well, you just have to make time. There isn't but one that can make time. That's Jesus. <laughs> the rest of us have to take time to minister and to deal with people that we come in contact with every day. Now, Jesus noticed the blind man. There's some people that we notice quicker than others. We always say the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And well, there's some that are really squeaking, I'll tell you. In fact, I think some of them's bearing shot. But uh, Jesus was able to look past the multitudes and the crowds and always does seize the person <clears throat> that is needing a touch from the master. Now, it's an amazing thing to me. <clears throat> Wherever you're at in the auditorium, if you come with a need, Jesus knows your need. And he can meet the need. <clears throat> Some people will come out and they'll say, Boy, how did you know this was going on in my life? I'm thinking the message wasn't even about that. <laughs> but you see, the Holy Spirit of God take the word of God and dealt with them exactly where they're at and led them to where they needed to be. Jesus noticed the woman at the well. He noticed Zacchaeus up in the top of the sycamore tree. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> he noticed the little widow that put in the two mites. He noticed the woman that touched the hem of his garment in the midst of the crowd. And he notices you this morning. Maybe you're here and you're singing and we had a, we had a glorious time singing this morning. But maybe you're singing and you have a hole in your heart. And I can't see it. I can't tell it. Wouldn't know what to do with it if I did know it. But Jesus sees and Jesus knows and Jesus cares. We may be hurting. We may be helpless. We may be hopeless, but he's not. And if we can just, like this lady, touch the hem of his garment, if we can receive that strength that is greater than our own, then our blinded eyes will be open if we put them on the Savior. Now, 
we come to rhyme or reason and it says and his disciples ask him saying master who who sinned was it this man or was it his parents and Jesus said neither hath this man sinned nor his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him <clears throat> it's amazing when adversity hits that, that the first words out of our mouth is, Lord, why me? I mean, why not them? I'm here, I'm a grinning at you the best I can on Sunday morning. Why me? Why is this happening to me? Well, in John 13, 16, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. You know, sometimes I forget that. Job 14 says, Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. In Acts 9, Jesus says about Paul, Ananias drew the black card on visitation and was supposed to go visit Paul. And he says, Wait a minute, Lord, this guy's killed disciples. He said, you go because I want to show him how, many, how much great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Philippians 1.29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now let me tell you something, we've got at least one too many evangelists that say, if you trust in Jesus, something good is going to happen to you. Well, that's a good news, bad news. Yes, something good, you're going to be saved. But the bad news is, that doesn't mean you're going to escape trials, troubles, and tribulation in your life. They that will suffer, they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So instead of why me, maybe you ought to be saying, why not me? Now, we need to look at this from heaven's perspective. And that's what really being a Christian is all about, is learning to see things through Jesus' eyes and not through our eyes. To be able to look at things like he sees them rather than how we see them. Remember when I said a while ago, I can see when your hand is up. Sometimes these guys on a lower level can't see. Well, we're on a lower level. And so we need to say, Lord, let me see things the way that you see things. Well, Jesus says, it happened that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Interesting. If or since we have been created by him, we are also created for him. Now, there are a lot of us that will agree the fact that we've been created by the Lord, but we don't want to come to grips with the fact that we've been created for the Lord. And he can do with us as it pleases him for his honor and for his glory. What if my death causes countless others to come to Christ? What if, in the midst of my troubles and trials and tears, a witness was given that would cause others to turn to Christ? What if people were affected more by the valleys in my life and how I handled the valleys than how I handled the mountaintops? That God's work, that God's power, that God's grace would be manifested in our lives. Talked to one of our men who said, I, I hope that my suffering isn't the results of sin. <laughs> Amen. I hope, I hope it's not. That's the first thing that we examine. Lord, is it me? Is it something that I've done that you're trying to correct in my life? But Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. It's a powerful passage. It does not mean all things are good. But it means that all things work together for good. To those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Lord, 
What do you try to show us? Well, there's the matter of darkness and light. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. The night cometh when no man can work. The night cometh when no man can work. We sing a song, and, and the trouble with so many of our hymns and so many of our songs, not the problem with the hymn or the song, it's the problem with us, is because we don't realize that, that the good ones are messages put to song, to music. Work for the night is coming when man works no more. That's biblical. Well, your life grows shorter, <laughs> and all of a sudden you, got, you realize you got more in your taillights than you got in your headlights. <laughs> You're going to live forever, but not down here. Every one of us, everyone here today is an eternal being. You will live forever. Its question is where? Now another thought, uh, when, when's the best time to witness? You know, I had a lady tell me one time about her future son-in-law. She said, well, Brother Butch, you need to be careful how you talk to him. You know, I said, you've known him three years. How many times have you talked to him about the Lord? She said, well, I haven't. I said, ma'am, I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. <laughs> I said, where am I going to offend him to? Hell number two? <clears throat> When's the best time to witness when the Lord lays it on your heart? <clears throat> to share with a neighbor or a family member? Uh, eternity, eternity is forever. And it does make a difference where you're going to spend it. What if you die with innocent blood on your hands? And, and see, I think about that every Sunday. There's every Sunday that people leave here who do not know the Lord personally as their Savior, that do not accept Him. But saving people is not my business. My business is telling people how to be saved. My business is to keep their blood off of my hands because I've been faithful to deliver the gospel. That's my business. And I fear that. But what if we die with innocent blood on our hands and what if they die without Christ? Or what about the seven years of the great tribulation, darkness across the land, believers gone, raptured away to be with Christ? The night cometh, the Bible says. The night cometh when no man can work. But the other side of that, the light of the world, you know, we also sing that with feeling. Come to the light, to shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon thee. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. So you choose this morning. Light or darkness? Light or darkness? And then I read verse 6 and 7, and it says... When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and he washed, and he came seeing. And now, the first words that, the first thought that came in my mind was MBO. MBO. And those who are in the business world, or who have been in the business world, MBO stands for management by objective. And that was a big thing. In other words, that you just don't go off like a shotgun, that you plan your work, you work your plan, you have focus, you have an objective, you have your eye on the goal, and you conduct yourself and you lead those around you to accomplish that goal. Is that not right? Management by objective. Now, there's a spiritual definition here that's even more important, MBO. 
And you know what it is? It's miracles by obedience. <laughs> So every time you see MBO, instead of thinking management by objective, you think of miracles by obedience. Now, consider this scene, and I believe that God desires this to be a common occurrence. Jesus makes the clay. He anoints the eyes of the blind man. And he sends him on his way, and he says, you go and you wash in the pool of Siloam. And Jesus didn't explain the outcome. He didn't say you wash in the pool of Siloam. And in 32 days you'll have sight. Like the two guys at the post office. They said your prayers aren't worth a blankety blank. I said what do you mean? If your prayers were worth a blankety blank we'd have rain. I said you too. You come and you sit on the front row. And I guarantee you in three days we'll have rain. And I went to the pickup and one of them said to the other one, Can he really do that? <laughs> but they ain't sitting here, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but there is, Jesus tells him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. He didn't explain the outcome. And he didn't tell him, You... I put that clay on, the, on your eyes. Now you name it and you claim it. Jesus didn't say that. He said, go on down there to the pool of Siloam. And you wash. And the guy did it. And he did it without debate. The Lord said do it. And he did it. And he did it without any argument. Now I'm thinking of another story. In 2 Kings chapter 5. You remember Naaman? <clears throat> Naaman was a captain in, in, in the king of Syria's army. And, and he was a mighty man of valor. And the Bible says that he had leprosy. <clears throat> and a little Hebrew maid, which, which was tremendous, she, she was in captivity... And, and she told him, she said, Sir, if you see Elisha, the prophet, the man of God, uh, I, I think he can take care of your leprosy. And so Naaman went up to Elisha's door, and Elisha didn't even come outside. He didn't answer the doorbell. He stayed on the inside, and he sent out word outside, Go down to the river Jordan and dip seven times and thou shalt be clean. And Naaman was tickled to death. No, you ain't read the story. He was madder than a hornet. Who is this preacher that won't answer the door and sends me off like a boy to wash an old muddy Jordan when we've got cleaner streams in our own country? And the servants told him, because they was a lot smarter than he was, they said if he would ask you to do something difficult, wouldn't you have done it? But if he asks you something simple, tells you to do something simple, dip seven times and you'll be clean, why wouldn't you do that? And then Naaman was obedient and he did what God said do and his flesh returned as pink as a baby's. Just as healthy as it could be. You know what that's about? That's, that's MBO. <laughs> that's a miracle by obedience. Well, if he wouldn't have been obedient, he wouldn't have seen a miracle. Now, if you don't get anything else out of the message, I think this is something you need to nail down this morning because it hit me like a ton of bricks I think that you and I miss many a miracle because of disobedience I think I think God wants to work miracles in our life I don't know what they are but I know biblically they begin with obedience 
And I believe that this blind man would have said, well, I'll tell you what, instead of going to the pool of Siloam, it's a long way down there, I'm just going to stop here at the water fountain and, and I'll just do, do this. Or if Naaman would have said, who's keeping count whether I do it five times or seven times? I, I don't think they would have ever seen See, the Lord is more concerned with obedience than he is sacrifice, is what the scripture says. Miracles by obedience well we want the miracle but we want the miracle our way fair statement we set the guidelines we set the parameters and you can tell it how we pray you know we're, we're getting you know if it wasn't so sad it'd be funny I mean because here we are a little finite, finite man and we're giving God instructions on how to work in our life I mean, he spoke the whole world into existence and we're going to help him out. Not that funny, but kind of seems that way. Well, notice there's some earthly answers for spiritual blessings. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to do you all a favor, but I want you to do me one. I'm not going to read verses 8 through 23 right now, but I'm going to ask you to read them yourself so you can get the the real gist of this conversation. Because the scribes and the Pharisees and everybody around, they had earthly answers for a spiritual blessing or for a spiritual miracle. Amen. It's interesting that the lost world always has an answer for a moving or a miracle of God. But there's something, there's a lesson that I have to understand and not them because they can't understand it, okay? And the problem is I think that they should when they can't. The Bible says that the natural man, in other words, the person that's not saved, doesn't understand the things of God. They are alien or foreign to him. Neither can he know them. So the world tries to put an earthly answer on a spiritual experience. When I was saved, my unsaved family, my unsaved friends, and even this community tried to get a handle on it. An earthly answer for a spiritual event. You know what it was? They, he, he changed religions. Now he's one of those. Mm-hmm. And that girl changed him. That's what he was. He used to be a good old boy, but the girl changed him. Because these were earthly answers for a spiritual transformation. Let me tell you something. If the girl would have changed me, and she's here today, I mean, let me tell you something. Perfume will only go so far. She did say you could sprinkle it on a pig, not fall it to the auction. But nevertheless, we're not going there. <laughs> Earthly answers for spiritual miracles, blessings. And here, the scribes and the Pharisees, they analyze, they scrutinize, and they always criticize what was truly a miracle of God. Always will. Now, I really get my tail in the crack when people doubt the miracles of God or what God has done in my life. I want to convince them or kill them and tell God they had a heart attack. That's what I want to do. In the flesh. But spiritually, they can't understand. And it's my problem, not their problem. Amen. Doubting Thomas is still among us. Well, the proof is in the pudding. You ever heard that? I got pictures of people making a pie. Didn't give me none. But they're still making a pie. And... and People say, oh, well, I do this, and I do this, and I do that, and I roll this, and I do that. I mean, don't bore me with that. Let's taste that sucker. 
The proof is in the pudding, right? Well, notice verse 25 here. They're giving him a hard time. He says, how many times do I have to tell you? Well, tell us one more time. What happened to you, boy? Well, Jesus came and Jesus made this clay and Jesus put it in my eyes, on my eyes. He told me to go wash and in the pool of Siloam and I went and washed in the pool of Siloam and I came back and, and, and now I can see. Okay, one more time. Tell us what happened. Well, Jesus made this clay. He put it in my eyes. He told me to go to wash in the pool of Siloam. I did that and I come back and now I can see. And they said, well, this guy's a sinner. And there's something else that happened here. And you need to fess up and you need to tell us. Now, I, I like this. He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. Now, listen to this. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I can see. You sit here and you fiddle dink around with all the rest of this. But let me tell you one thing. I was blind and now I can see. And, and, and you just go to seed on the rest of it. Where once I was blind, now I can see. What a powerful passage. But this is a physical experience that teaches a far greater spiritual lesson. Jesus desires to open blinded eyes. He desires to do it. it. It was in this passage. It was in blind Bartimaeus' life. Remember that? Set by the highway begging. And when he received his, his sight, it says simply that he followed Jesus in the way. He was a disciple of him. How many of us receive something of the Lord, a miracle of the Lord, a blessing of the Lord, and we say, thank you, Jesus, and then we go our own way? These who received their sight followed Jesus in the way. Well, it was that way with Paul on the road to Damascus. His eyes were blinded by religion. He met Jesus in the way. The Bible says that the scales fell from his eyes and he received sight. And he arose and he was baptized. Now let me tell you something. Baptism doesn't have anything to do with salvation, but it's got everything to do with obedience. And some need to hear me this morning. It was proof. He, the, you didn't have to find him with a spotlight and a hunting dog. He wanted, to, he wanted to be baptized. He arose. He received sight. He said, I want to identify with Christ. His death, his burial, his resurrection. I want to follow him. I want to be obedient to him. Now, the proof of the miracle was a changed life. In the little book, In the Beginning God Created the Country Church, The Miracle at Marion, the proof of the miracle is not in these 16 acres. It's not in these buildings. It's not in the arena. The miracle is one more life changed by the power of the gospel. And, and a thought came to me, you could be a miracle waiting to happen this morning. <laughs> a miracle just waiting to happen. To take place. And there's only one missing ingredient. Obedience. Obedience. Wow. Jesus desires to open blinded eyes. Now, there's spiritual or physical healing. In verse 35, and you can follow along through verse 39, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, the blind man, or the man that was blind. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Do you believe on the Son of God? 
He answered and he said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it's he that talks with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment, I am coming to this world, that they which see might not, they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. You see, this man could have had his spiritual sight or his physical sight restored and still not been saved. Somebody will say, well, uh, he must be a believer. She must be a believer because we prayed for this healing in our life and she was healed. And? You see, this old boy was healed. He had his physical sight restored. But if he wouldn't have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior and given him the glory, he'd have spent eternity in hell. You can have a physical healing. You can have a prayer that you've hurled towards heaven, you can have that answered in your life and still not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Because at the beginning of this passage, Jesus said it wasn't this man's sin and it wasn't his parents' sin. It was that the work of God might be made manifest. And the work of God was really made manifested, not in the opening of the physical eyes, but in the opening of the spiritual eyes, when he received the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. The story doesn't end with his receiving physical sight. The story ends with him receiving spiritual sight. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. The Lord can heal you this morning. I don't know your heart. I couldn't handle it if I did. You may suffer from a divorce. You may suffer from a disease. You may suffer from depression. You may suffer from despair. You may feel, feel like you're at the end of your rope. But let me tell you some tie knot and hang on. Because Jesus is here. And Jesus wants to work a work in your life and a work in my life. But the miracle will come by obedience. Don't receive a miracle and miss the master. Matthew 6.33 Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Brother Butch, I've got this. Brother Butch, I've got that. Brother Butch, I've got this. But do you have Jesus? Other foundation can no man lay except that which is laid in Christ Jesus. And if you're here and you're not saved, that is the greatest need of your life. Not the groceries, not the rent, not the heart problem, not the cancer, not the, the greatest need in your life. If you are cured from every physical ailment that you ever had and ever hoped to have, one day you will die. The greatest need in your life is to know that you know that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And you can today. He didn't die on the cross before the whole world to try to keep salvation from you. But it comes by obedience to him. He says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you do, he does. Well, I hope he saves me. What, accidentally? <laughs> by osmosis? It'll come by a deliberate act of your will. Granted, you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But it's an act of your will to surrender. 
Lord, I have sinned. I ask you to forgive me of my sin, to come into my heart and life and save me. And he'll do it. We invite people to come. I, I'll tell you this. We're not a seeker-sensitive church. <laughs> Go off here in this little corner and somebody will sneak around and try to talk to you. Listen, if Jesus saves you or you want to be saved openly and publicly, let go and let God have his way. He wasn't ashamed of you. Don't be ashamed of him. Everybody who comes, the way of the cross leads home. We all come the same way. And if you're not saved, right where you're at, agree with God. Lord, I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and life and save me. And upon the authority of God's word, he'll do just that. Your coming will, also, will be a testimony to the Lord. But let me tell you something. It'll be an encouragement to somebody else. It'll be an encouragement to somebody else. Maybe you're here and you're saved, but you've never identified with him as a believer in baptism. You need to get that on the right side of your salvation. Not for your salvation's sake, for obedience sake. I believe that he died for me, that he was buried, that he rose again. I'm dead to myself and I'm raised to walk in the likeness of Christ. You know, water baptism is a message in and of itself. It's a testimony that I understand that when I was saved, I was immersed into the body of Christ. In other words, I was as saved as I was ever going to get. I was saved from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. When I followed him in believer's baptism, water baptism, I'm showing the world physically what I understand to be true spiritually. And it's by that obedience that I identify with him. You're here, saved, but not identified. Make that decision. Now here's the big one. And it's a big one because it's a stumbling block. You are saved. You are scripturally baptized. But you're not a part of the local church. And God's leading you here. You know it. You got people. We got people that are perpetual visitors. You need to light, brother. You need to light, sister. And plant your life. Whatever that decision. Make it for his honor and glory. Let's stand. Let's pray today. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, how good you are. How that you would open blinded eyes that we might see. Father, I pray that my eyes would be open, attentive to you. And Father, when they are, then I in turn can pray for others that are all around that need to make that decision today. I pray that they've got the courage. I pray that they've got the conviction the prompting by your Holy Spirit to make a decision that brings glory to your Son and our Savior. And we'll be forever grateful because it's in your name and only your name that we ask it. The precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you don't know where you will spend eternity, call Pastor Ike. He will clearly explain how to be saved and know for sure that you are saved. God bless and have a wonderful day. How do you define country? We think about our flag and the men and women who fought to keep us free. We think about what it is to have family and friends who love and support us. We think about the freedom we're blessed with. We think about the future generations and the values we instill in them. Most of all, we think of faith and our Savior, Jesus Christ. How do you define country? Hi, I'm Butch Eichels, pastor of the Country Church, Marion, Texas, welcoming you.